Okay, so for the final part of 5-2 notes, and there actually will be a reward at the end of this video, so for those of you that have actually done as I requested and have watched all six of these parts now, um, you will be rewarded for your hard work um, as soon as we finish this example. But anyway, this is example 12. For the last part of uh, part 5, I went ahead and finished up example 13, so this is the last example we have to finish up. It is obviously a very wordy example. I'll trust that you guys can kind of read through that. Um, it gives us all sorts of information, and then what you do not have is the diagram that is very important as well. Um, so anyway, just kind of going through that, you've got a 2 kilogram block that is sliding. So this one here is my 2 kilogram block that is sliding at 10 meters per second, and that is information they did not give us on the uh, in the question up there. Then it collides with a uh, 3 kilogram block that is at rest. So this one's initially at rest. They tell us that it is a totally inelastic collision, which is again is very important when they say it's totally inelastic or perfectly inelastic. We know that that tells us then that they stick together, right? So that tells us that they stick together, um, which is very important in finding my final velocity. Um, and then they compress into a spring. They bounce back from the spring. They end up sliding off the table. They ask us to find all sorts of fun information, which ties both new momentum with old energies and whatnot. Um, so this question is a very good question for going through the new stuff we've learned as well as the old stuff in energies that some of us still have a little bit of trouble with. Uh, but anyway, let's go through. So part A, part A asks us to find the velocity of the two blocks immediately after the collision. So really for part A, I don't care about the spring, I don't care about the table. Um, the only significance of the table is that it is a smooth table, so there's no friction. And so for part A, what that tells me then is momentum is conserved because there's no outside force acting. So my momentum is conserved. Um, so then I'm just doing a collision the same way hopefully you guys are starting to get comfortable with. So before the collision, the only box moving is that uh, that two kilogram block, right? So M1 times its velocity. You could go ahead and add the second one in there, but again, the second one's initially at zero. So it really doesn't come into play at all. After the collision, they stick together. So as we've seen now a handful of times, if they stick together, I can just find the sum of their masses times a common final velocity, right? Because they're both moving at the same final velocity. So hopefully part A is pretty easy, right? They give us all the measurements. Um, they give us the initial block was, was a mass of, excuse me, 2, not 3. So 2 kilograms times its initial velocity of 10. Now if I define this as positive 10, which is fine, if I define that as a positive 10, it just means I have to realize that if it's going off to the left, left is my positive direction. Um, so it doesn't matter a whole lot either way. If you wanted to find that as a positive 10 or a negative 10, it doesn't matter too much. I may go ahead and leave this as a positive since this was the original direction it was moving. Um, but anyway, the total mass would be the 2 kilogram mass plus the 3 kilogram mass, so obviously 5, and then the final velocity. So 2 times 10 is 20, 20 divided by 5. I find that my final velocity after the collision is a positive 4. Right, my final velocity after the collision is a positive 4, which is important because that tells me that it's still moving the same direction as my positive 10. So after the collision, these two blocks are now moving together to the right at 4 meters per second. Um, and they're essentially acting as one mass, right, because they're moving together. So anyway, like I said, hopefully part A was pretty easy after everything you guys have done. Part B. Part B asks us the distance that the spring will compress. So now that these two masses are moving, they, they slide into the spring. They give us the spring constant in the problem of 775, and it obviously will compress a certain distance. Well, this just goes back to last chapter. It really is as easy as before the blocks hit the spring, they're traveling with a certain kinetic energy, right? After the blocks compress into the spring, that moment that they're at the furthest compress compression, the blocks would be momentarily at rest, which tells me all of the kinetic energy will have transferred to spring potential energy, elastic potential, right? So this is the relationship I'm working with. Well, kinetic energy is just one-half mass times velocity squared. The potential energy is just one-half k times delta x squared, right? How far it's been compressed squared. Um, so again, hopefully this one's pretty easy. I've got the mass of the two blocks together, so their total mass is 5. I've got the velocity of those two blocks together, so 4. So 1 half 5 times 4 squared equals 1 half the spring constant they gave me was 775. And then I'm looking for how far it compresses. 
So again, it's as easy as setting this equation up and just making sure you don't forget any of your squared values or anything like that. So this obviously ends up being 16 times 5, so uh, 80, and then half of 80 is 40. Or if you want to cancel the one half out, I guess that might be easier too. So 80 equals the 775 delta x squared. And then just solving the rest of the way for delta x, um, you should end up getting that delta x equals about 0 0.321 meters. So about 32 centimeters is how far that spring system would compress as those blocks reach their max, maximum compression. Uh, but anyway, part B just goes back to what we saw last chapter with energy. Right? So part C, the velocity of the blocks after they leave the spring. This is almost more of a concept question. You could do the exact same thing. You could say, well, as they leave the spring, right, as they leave the spring, I'm now going from the elastic potential energy the spring potential right back to kinetic. Well, since there's no friction involved, there wasn't any energy lost, right? So if the blocks together, and I'm assuming these is the, this is the two blocks together, right, slide into the spring, they cause it to compress, it compresses, it returns those blocks right back the other direction. If there's not any energy loss, we know that the velocity is simply going to be the same magnitude, just the opposite direction, right? So if I've defined that initial velocity as a positive 4, then I would simply need to realize that this velocity is now a negative 4 meters per second, negative implying it reversed directions. So there's not really any calculation you have to do for part C. The velocity after they leave the spring would be negative 4 meters per second. And again, the negative just implying the fact they've now reversed directions. Um, so anyway, part C. Then for part D, the distance the blocks travel before they hit the ground. Well, just like you've seen several times, right, and hopefully pretty easy, this is just kinematics. Right? How high is the table? The table is 1.2 meters tall. So from that information, can't we find the time that it takes to hit the ground? Well, my initial vertical velocity, my initial vertical component is 0. My acceleration is 9.8. My height, my delta y, if you will, is 1.2. I've got those three measurements, so finding the time for those two blocks to leave the table and then hit the ground is hopefully pretty easy at this point, right? So I'll do that, obviously, down here. Uh, the time for those two blocks to hit the ground. So again, I've got my initial vertical component of zero. Don't make that the negative four. I know sometimes that's the, the mistake that we make, but it's not moving up or down yet. The acceleration is 9.8. The height, the change in height is 1.2. So then I'm just using my delta y equals v sub zero t plus one half at squared, right? And I'm finding my time. So 1.2 equals the initial velocity of zero goes away. So one half times 9.8 times t squared. So then solving for my time, I should get about 0.49 seconds. Right? So that's how long it takes to hit the ground. It's about 0.49 seconds. Um, and then using the, uh, using the total distance, or to find the total distance, excuse me, I'm using the horizontal velocity, right? So my horizontal velocity equals delta x over t. I know the time, and I know the horizontal component of their velocity is just how fast they're going. So I would probably drop the negative for this part um, I would just make that a 4 equals delta x over the time. If you did leave the negative over there, just realize the negative distance implies that it's going to the right that far. But I may go ahead and drop it for this part. So delta x then equals uh, 4 times 0 0.049, so 1.98 meters from the edge of the table. So that's how far it goes from the edge of the table. I know I went through that pretty quickly, but at this point in the year, you should know how to do that. So I'm assuming you guys do know how to do that. And then finally, the kinetic energy of the blocks just before they hit the ground. Any number of ways that we could do this. Now, it is very important, though, unlike some of the past problems, I actually cannot go all the way back to the very start. And the reason I can't do that is the very start, we just had one of the blocks moving, right? We had one of the blocks moving and one of the blocks sitting still. I cannot go back to the very start because in the collision, kinetic energy is not necessarily conserved. And in fact, the fact that it is an inelastic collision tells me energy is not conserved. So I cannot go back to before the collision, but I can go to any point after the collision. Um, and so if I want to find my kinetic energy just before it hits the ground, I can relate it to the total energy anywhere along the way. So if I wanted to go to the spring energy, if I wanted to say that when those two blocks are completely compressed and on the table, they would have both spring potential energy and gravitational potential energy, if I wanted to find that total energy, 
and relate that to the kinetic energy before it hits the ground? I absolutely could. If I wanted to find the total energy that it has at the edge of the table, so the kinetic energy plus the gravitational energy that it has at the end of the table, I could do that and then relate that to the final kinetic energy as it hits the ground. The one thing we need to make sure we're watching out for is it is not just the gravitational energy equals the kinetic. By far the most common mistake that I know I will still see is it is not just gravitational to kinetic energy. Because as it hits the ground, the total energy is now kinetic. So we have to find the total energy at some point before. So I will probably use this to reference because that may be the easiest one to do. I'm going to say the kinetic energy at the table plus the potential energy due to gravity at the table equals the final kinetic energy as it hits the floor. All right, so all I have to do is find those energies and total them up. It's really not a challenging problem as long as you understand the concept. Right? Once I have this set up, it's a very easy calculation. So one half the total mass of both of the blocks together, the total velocity of both of the blocks together moving squared, plus potential energy would be the total mass of both blocks times gravity times the height of the table. I'm not going to break this up, so I'm not going to cancel the masses out. I'm going to leave those in there and find my total. So one half the total mass of both of those blocks together is again 5. The total velocity, yes, it is a negative 4, but obviously when I square that, the negative 4 doesn't matter. Plus the 5 times 9.8 times the height of 1.2 would equal my final kinetic energy as it hits the ground. Again, guys, never use kinetic or never use kinematics to find the, the kinetic energy down here. You're doing way more work than you need to do if we just relate it to energies. Um, so anyway, totaling all those up, um, I end up getting that this kinetic energy is 40 joules of energy plus the potential energy due to gravity should be about 58.8 joules of energy. So then my total kinetic energy as it hits the ground is 98.8 joules of kinetic energy. Uh, so anyway, part E here, again, going back to energies, I know this is a part in particular a lot of us struggle with, so please watch this, rewatch this, do whatever you have to do, but you need to get very comfortable with this part of that question. Um, but anyway, so we've finished question uh, 12, and we finished out the rest of our 5.2 notes. I did tell you guys at the start of this video that if you listened all the way through, you would be rewarded. Um, and here's your reward for that. Okay, so there is a short extra, extra credit quiz, uh, bonus quiz, that will be posted on the Edmodo page. So I will post the link to the quiz on Edmodo. You need to make sure that obviously you are signed up for Edmodo. I know a few of us slackers are still not. Um, so here's the join code. For your Edmodo course. Again, I will post a link to the extra credit, extra credit quiz, having trouble saying that, to the bonus quiz. Um, I will post that link up on Edmodo. You just simply have to take the link. It's only a four or five question quiz, so it won't take you very long to get through. Um, so as long as you've watched all of these videos, you'll breeze through the quiz pretty quickly, and you'll get a couple extra credit points going towards homework um, from that quiz. So anyway, Thank you if you have watched all of these videos, if you have taken this serious, I appreciate it. Again, I hate being gone, but I know um, we still need to keep moving forward. Um, so anyway, if you need the join code for Edmodo, there it is, BKTS29. Um, and then there will be a link posted on Edmodo for the quiz. Just make sure you get that done by Monday for your extra credit.